I get a chance to preach to you directly, sometimes God gives me different things, and today is a is a deal that I'm I'm excited about. You know, <clears throat> I woke up this morning and uh, had my lips stuck out on Father's Day. <laughs> the first thing I hear, I said, well, first thing I wake up, my roll over, and my wife's not in the bed, and so I'm, uh oh. And uh, but I know she's cooking. She was going to get up in the middle of the night and start smoking some briskets and for all the not smoking, but she had some kind of recipe that smelled real good. She had my portable meat thermometer in them in the oven. And she's studying, this was going to be some more kind of good, you know. And I think she's up there, and I, I, I walk into the living room, and she's piled up on the couch, and she says, oh, I'm sorry, no Father's Day lunch. So I'm up for grabs, anybody? <laughs> <laughs> so, so she's homesick, and it's raining, and... Then we got all the generators yesterday. Thank everybody for helping my kids. Like 30-something trees down on fence rows. One still in the middle of their house. Limbs five feet away from my grandkid. Hitting the house where they were laying in a bathtub during those tornadoes. And God's, everybody's okay. So thank you all for praying. Thank you for helping. And and uh, so yesterday, get the generators back home all excited. Electricity on, first thing I hear. I got everybody moved out of the house. Woo! glory and now their electricity's out again <laughs> so, <laughs> can I move in with y'all <laughs> no I'm just kidding sometimes there's so many things that happen that you just gotta laugh or cry so I, I found this one of our church members and we can laugh about this it's okay because um some time has passed, and they've healed up from these wounds, okay? You know, some you can't laugh when certain things happen, but after the fact, you can laugh. So this is okay. They're healed up and everything, but I'll read this to you. They went back and found, it says, oh, explanation point, explanation point. Well, I'm in the emergency room right now, oh, face, crying tear. It says, today was not a good day at all. I decided to go horseback riding and release some of my boredom. Something uh, happened along the way. Something, it's something I hadn't done in a long time, in a long while. And so I turned, turned out to be a big mistake, exclamation point. I got on the horse and started out fine, nice and slow. Then it got faster and faster. And before I knew it, it was going as fast as a horse could possibly go. And I couldn't keep up with the pace, and I fell off. I caught my foot in the stirrup, and the horse was dragging me, and it wouldn't stop. I hit my head, dragged up, dragged, let's see, hit my head and banged, my, banged up my back and elbow, pretty near tore my pants half off. <laughs> so here we go. And thank goodness the manager of the General Dollar Store came out and unplugged the machine. <laughs> this person is really here. I'm going to tell you who it is, maybe. <laughs> They're really here. But then she had the nerve to take the rest of my chain away, change away so I couldn't ride the elephant or the motorcycle. For Pete's sake, I was even banned from getting on the, the uh, merry-go-round. <laughs> Sometimes you got to laugh. It's Jean Petty. You can tell her about the, ask her about the details on that. No, she said that to me. I just thought, hey, we got to laugh. But uh, I want you to find in your Bibles the book of contents in the very front where it has all the books in there and the page numbers. <laughs> Seriously, find it and look in the Old Testament for a book that's called a Ezekiel, E-Z-E-K-I-E-L. And look at the page number. Find that in your Old Testament and turn to that page number and find chapter 22 and verse 30. I don't have all the Old Testament books memorized, and that's what I do, so I figured I'd tell you that's how you do it. So <laughs> don't flip around and just go right straight. There, find out what page number it is and find it and get after it. So Ezekiel chapter 22 and verse 30. It says, And I saw a man among them 
who should build up the wall and stand in the breach, to stand in the gap, and therefore before me and the land, and and I and and I that I should not destroy it, and I found none. So there were plenty of males here in this situation, but God couldn't find a man. Think about that. There were plenty of males there, but God couldn't find a man. What does that mean? It means they were a bunch of grown, full grown. They're full grown, but they weren't men. What's God talking about? So what I'm talking about today is this. The title of this message is when men become boys. And I don't have that backwards. When men become boys. There were a bunch of males there, but they were boys. They weren't men in God's eyes. And so, uh, so... When I was a, a young man, if you called somebody a boy, it was fighting words. You know, everybody's wanting to be a man and thought you was a man, and you'd fight over somebody calling you a boy. And and uh, it was just kind of the way we did things. But just because we'd fight over somebody calling him boy didn't make you a man at all. Didn't make you a man. And so we're, we're living in a day where people are giving up Meaning in their life for money and chasing the things of the world, giving giving up our purpose for pleasure. Purpose for pleasure, and it seems to be in no greater place or no not seen anymore, or that you could point your finger at and say, "Here's the reason why." But this is showing up in our men right now more than ever in America. Would you agree with me? It's just there's, we're so busy. We're doing all these different things, and so we're we're tra- trading our our meaning for money, our purpose for pleasure. So this struggle of manhood today, that the Bible calls it, is upside down in our world right now. Uh, upside down. It's 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 and it's in our men. So it's it's like almost if i look at it now looking back it's almost like a refusal to be a man a refusal to be whether it's a refusal to be a man or whether it's a failure to be a man uh, or become a man we're full grown men but we're acting like boys according to god is what he's saying so as God defines us in the Bible, we're not to be boys. We're warriors. We're in an army. We're not sissies. We're to act like man. And because we're not, our world is in chaos right now and upside down. So the decline of men in churches, the decline of men in marriages, the decline of men in broken families is upside down. Why? Because we're not acting like men. So just as it's possible to be a male and not be a man, according to what we're seeing already in Scripture, just as it's possible to, to be a male and not a man, look at this, it's possible to be a full-grown man and be a boy. I say things a little different, but that makes sense, right? Just as it's possible for, for you to be a, a, a male but not be a man, it's very possible for you to be a full-grown man and be a boy. So the question today is, are we raising men? Are we raising spiritual sissy boys that are 25 and 35 and 45, 55 and 75 or whatever years old, but still boys? Full-grown man, but a boy. So how do you make sure you're a man and not a boy, or not still a boy? Or, or how do you change from being a boy in God's eyes to a spiritual man? Where, where do we get started on this Father Day, Father's Day? My prayer was one simple thing, is that you came in here and we leave changed. Me, you, as men, that, because listen to me, we have an encounter with God, and he changes us from the inside out. And so, the first thing that every male needs to know is that there's some things that we need to unplug. 
and just making a fool out of you if we continue to allow this thing to run. There's some things that we just we need some help with, and we're out of control, and this bucking machine or this horsey is going doom, 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 and we're laying on our back making a, because we're not standing up and being God's men. And so the first thing you want to do, I think, to unplug this deal that Satan has going on in our lives and the temptations and the tracks is, number one, you have to own your purpose. If you've listened to the last few messages, I've been on this ownership. you got to own it. Own your purpose. See, God didn't just put you here for no reason. When you gave your life, if you were a man and you gave your life to Jesus Christ, you were drafted into his purpose drafted into his calls, drafted into God's purpose, and and that is when we're drafted into God's purpose, we step into that, we begin to make a difference for God. Can I get a big amen if you know what I'm talking about? Man, when you get when you get your hand, when you take ownership of your purpose that God's put you here and the gifts and the talents and the abilities, there's nothing any better. And so this is spelled out in scripture, turn over to Ephesians, that's where all the books end in I-N-S, Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, Acts, Romans, and then all the books that have I-A-N-S are all in a group right there together. So Ephesians chapter 4 and verse 11, if you've been to Saddle Up, you know this is the key, this is the foundation, this is what we're to do, this is what we've been praying that we get good at as a church. When you join the church and you fill out a connect card, that's your very first step to moving forward and said, I need the Lord in my life, and I'm ready to take some steps forward in my life. But the second step is you, number one, being following him in believer's baptism and then saying, okay, I've got that done, and then you go to saddle up. Now, you may be 65 years old, and you haven't been to saddle up because you don't, and you don't know what your gifts and your talents and your purpose is, and you'll just have to decide whether in God's eyes you're a boy or a man after you read this scripture. I'm not sure, but look at it. In Ephesians chapter 4, starting in verse 11, he says, And he gave the apostles and the prophets and evangelists and the shepherds and the teachers. He gave. When these men gave their lives to Jesus Christ, they, these people received a gift as apostles over some ministries and prophets. I have the gift of prophecy. I can bring application to Scripture, to illustrations, to things that you see. I can explain Tony Evans has that gift. It's bringing application to the Holy Word of God that you can understand it. Evangelist, I have the gift of evangelism. I love reaching out to lost people. It's a gift from God's shepherd. I have that gift too. So I'm, I'm always trying to herd you and help you get to greener pastures and teaching. I have that gift as well, and many of you do. So these are gifts given by God to, look, number 12, verse 12, to equip. Can I hear you say the word equip real loud, please? Equip. That's what we're to do. These gifts, the church, when you, when you get deployed and, and, and drafted into his army, okay, as a man, we are to equip the saints those that have given their life to Christ for the work of ministry and the building up of the body of Christ. So see, you become part of the team. You become part of the body of Christ. We call it a dream team. We have individual pieces and parts in that. But your gift is to fit and find, and you own your purpose when you figure out what your gift is. And so in verse 13 it says, until, we're going to continue doing this, until the unity of the faith and the knowledge of the Son of God. So until we are all unified and we're headed, standing on the Word of God and to the knowledge, that's the Word of God, applying the Word of God in our lives, the knowledge of the Son of God to mature, what's that word? Manhood. So that's how we become mature. We own it. We own our purpose to mature manhood by discovering what our gifts are and using them to make a difference to God. The Scripture goes on and says, to the measure, in other words, how much God gives you that gift to do, the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ. So you hear us say all the time that you, number one, are to know God. 
in this service today, if you don't know Jesus Christ as your Savior and Lord, I'm going to give you an opportunity to pray to receive Jesus, be filled with the power of the Holy Spirit, and, and changed and forgiven for everything that you've done wrong. There is nothing in the world better than getting saved and getting all that junk off of you and having a new beginning. Can I get a big old amen? Nothing is better. I remember the just the weights pulled off of me that day that I found Jesus Christ. You got to know God. That's your first step. And maybe that's your step today, but that's, you don't stop there. Then you've got to find freedom. Once I accepted Jesus Christ, I had one leg in sin and one leg in church. And I had to get some help because this leg was stuck here and this leg wanted to be here, but this leg was pulling the, and I had to get some help from some other men to get me out of some stuff and get both legs in church, both legs in the Word of God. I had to find out my purpose and own it, and I found freedom in my life because I started getting stronger. And I had some stronger men around me than I was, and they weren't willing, to, they were willing to just grab me by the ear and pick me plumb up off the ground and said, boy, what are you doing? Stop it. And you need somebody in your life that's big and bad and strong enough to pick you up off the ground spiritually and physically and maybe say, stop it. And if you don't have that in your life, you're probably never going to find freedom. And if you're, not, if you're not going to a small group, you're probably never going to find freedom in your life. You're going to keep on doing it all by yourself. Which, by the way, how's that working for you? You got saved five years ago and you ain't changed a bit. I'm just saying you got to find freedom when we do that in small groups. And then your purpose. We're talking about owning your purpose. The gifts help you discover. It says here in the Scripture to mature manhood and so that you're no longer a boy. This next Scripture says toss to and fro like every wind of doctrine. You're just always bouncing around from this to this and this temptation and blah, 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 blah. No, mature manhood, you discover your purpose, you own your purpose, and you'll do that in Saddle Up the first week in August. I don't care if you're 75 or 15. If you haven't been, you don't know what your gifts are, you have to get a point until you you discover your purpose, and that's going to be done in Saddle Up. And then the fourth thing we you hear us say, make a difference. That's when you change from being a boy to a man. When you own your purpose, you discover your purpose, you move forward in your life. When, uh, uh, when I was a baby, I loved horses. And it was because my daddy would go work cattle, and my Daddy would let my mama ride Bud, and I would, he would pick me up and set me on saddle with mama. And I literally, and I've had several people tell me, I would chew on the saddle horn and break my teeth in on the saddle horn. So I grew up loving horses and cows. As soon as I could, uh, my daddy was an order buyer, so he always came across these little ponies. And so we lived at this time, when I remember the ponies starting, showing up, he would either bring Bud home and just turn him loose in our backyard downtown, cyclone fence, and his best ranch horse would come and babysit me. And I would lead him over by a swing set of the fence, and I'd crawl up on him, and I'd get off on him. Big, full-grown horse, I'd find a way to crawl up on him bareback, and I'd fall off, and old Bud would just stick his head down there and say, what you doing? You're in the wrong place, son. And I'd crawl back up, and that's where I'd get. And he started getting my own, my own horses and ponies and stuff like that. And when my daddy died, I was seven years old, and we had a slew of horses. We didn't sell one single horse. I was seven years old, and I rode every one of them. The ones that weren't broke, I broke. Seven, eight, nine, ten. By the time I was 13 years old, I wanted to be a, a world champion horse trainer. And so I started breaking horses for other people. When I was 13 years old, I started making money when I was 13 years old. And my mama didn't have to go goad me into making money and going and getting a job. By the time I was 15, 14, I was a, a barn hand and a, a ring hand taking horses in at B&B Horse Auction. Y'all, anybody old enough to remember B&B Horse Auction around here? 
So that was, I was a little kid, and there you saw running horses, spinning around at 14, 13, 14 years old. By the time I was 15, I was working for them all the time. And so I would break their colts. I would work with their halter horses and their pleasure horses. I would lope horses. I would sell horses as a 14 and a 15-year. By the time I was 15 years old, Steve Wright moved from Iowa down here that had won the world in reigning. And he, we all got to know each other, and I asked if I could go work for him, and they both agreed without any hard feelings because it was a great opportunity for a young man, and I asked Steve Wright to train me and teach me everything he know, knew. From the age of 15 to 16, by the time I was 17, I was a ranch manager. By the time I was 18, I was winning uh, state titles and things and reigning and stuff like that because I asked to be trained. I owned it. I wanted to be a horse trainer. And I didn't want to just, I wanted it all. I owned it. My mama didn't have to ask me to go get a job. I went and found me a job. I knew I had to have a truck, so I made money. And I bought my truck before I was 16. Yes, they got a a loan for me because I was too young, but I paid every penny of that truck. 1975, Chevrolet, three-quarter ton, four-speed in the floor. Glass packs with the water hose run plumb up in there while it was hot and bust them out. Anybody with me? Okay. Big mud tires in the back stereo. I'm 15 years old. Woo, we got my license yet. Paying for a truck. By the time I was 16, I drove it legally, got my license. The point is, my purpose in life was to be a horse trainer, and I had to have transportation. And I was tired of my mama and people driving me to work, people picking me up. When I was 16, 15, workers' permit, 16, got my license. point is, you got to own it. And in the same way that you own your career, you think about everything you've ever had to do, sir, if you've done it at any level of quality at all, you've had to study. If you're a welder, you had to study under welders that were better than you. If you're, if you're an engineer, you had to study under engineer. If you're a cowboy, you had to study under cowboys that were a whole lot better than you were. You had to do these things. And so you, uh, you, you're, your mama don't have to nag you. Your wife, for Pete's sake, sir, doesn't need to nag you to do these things. You need to own your purpose. Your wife doesn't need to nag you to come to church. If you're going to be go from being a boy to a man, you need to own your purpose with God. You own it. Nobody should ever have to nag you into doing anything for God. And the reason they're doing that is because you don't own it and you're still a boy not trying to make you mad. I'm just saying in God's eyes, man, you're just still a pre-K deal. And God wants us to move from boy to man. Amen? But you got to own it. You got to own your purpose for God. Number two, you need to take responsibility. Can I get a big amen? <laughs> you got to take responsibility. You, as a, When you go from a boy to a man, you accept some big responsibilities Look at Ephesians chapter 5 and verse 25. Begins to explain our responsibilities as men. It says, husbands, love your wives as Christ loved the church and gave himself for her. So you got to understand, Jesus owned the purpose. He gave his life for us. And it says we're to take responsibility and love our wives as Christ loved the church. That's a sacrificial love. Keep reading in verse 26. It says that he might sanctify her, having cleansed her by the washing of the water of the word. What's he saying? Her spiritual condition of the washing of the water of the word is your biblical responsibility. If you're going to go from being a boy to a man, you have to take on your wife and your family's spiritual responsibility. If your wife jumps sideways in the middle of the road, and her mouth goes off like a, I don't know. You know what I'm talking about? It just goes, whoa. 
and she's sinning. Sins are coming out of her mouth, slander, whatever it is. Or she, you, you're, she is your biblical responsibility, and you've got to jerk a knot in her tail with the Word of God and loving her sacrificially and praying and leading her and bringing spiritual accountability. You have to take biblical responsibility for that. And if your husband can't do that to you, he's probably still a boy. Doesn't matter what his age is. If you're running him, you're married to a boy. He's got to love you with a sacrificial love. Give up everything for you like Christ did the church. And then it says here that he might sanctify you, having cleansed you by the washing of the water of the word. It's his biblical responsibility. Now, you're not married. That's really a good thing. <laughs> Paul says if you're not married, then that's, you can do more for the Lord. It's good that you will remain single. I'm talking to men and ladies here, of course. Because you can devote your whole life to the Lord. But the Bible does say, Paul says, that if you, if you uh, burn with lustful passion, you're supposed to get married. But if you don't burn with lustful passion, it could be that you have the gift of singleness. And that's a wonderful thing because you can devote all of your life to making a difference for God. And if you're a man that's single, that's not necessarily a bad thing. That could be the best thing in the world for you. Because you can own your purpose, you can take responsibility for what God has you doing, and if you're engaged, you're to practice these things with whoever you're engaged with. If you're dating, you're to practice these things with whoever you're dating, which, by the way, I don't find the word dating in here. I find the word betrothed. When anybody started dating in the Bible, it was to do one thing, and that is to get married. So you date to get married. You don't date to fornicate. Okay? You don't date. If you got lustful passion, you go get married. You may have to get married pretty quick, but you wait, and that's God's plan for the family. And so take responsibility as a man. And then number three, the last thing I'm going to give you is this. You need to understand authority. Understand authority. And I probably told you this story. It's just the story that stuck in my mind. Me and Ty, I, I cook a, a, um, a tank. I can't remember what kind of tank it was. It was long, and it was about this big around, and I cut the ends of it out to make a culvert in our creek behind the house so we could drive tractors and stuff this, this creek and, and feed on the other side of this creek. And then I started getting gravel with the front end loader, and I started putting gravel that I dug off our own place around this. The problem was the culvert one it wasn't wide enough. And by the time I piled all that gravel up on top of that thing, it kept getting narrower and narrower and narrower at the top. Well, by the time we finished this thing, Ty's four-wheel drive Chevrolet truck was on the other side of the culvert. You know, when you first put gravel up, it's not set up and it's, you know, it's, it didn't have a lot of moisture and it's like sandy and it would give away. And I told Ty when he drives across that culvert, Pay attention because it took you up in the air. When you're up in the air and you're looking down something, you can't really tell where your tires are. All you can see is your vehicle because you can't see the ground. I said, pay attention. And I said, and put it in four-wheel drive before you go across in case that the side of that culvert starts giving away and that, that freshly unpacked gravel just slides out from underneath your truck and you flip your truck upside down. And he said, yes, sir. He goes across. He starts veering. And I'm like, oh, boy. I said, whatever you do, don't stop. And sure enough, his back tire, it breaks and gives away. And I said, Ty, I told you to pay attention. And I got on to him, and he said, I did it. I did it perfect. And I said, no, you didn't do it perfect. He said, yes, sir, I did do it perfect. I said, Ty, come here and come on this side of the culvert. And he gets out of his truck, goes through the creek, or walks across the culvert, and he looks down there, and he sees. I said, look at your tire tracks. And he said, well, I guess I was wrong, wasn't I? And that's a stupid little illustration. But I believe that this understanding authority is the biggest indicator from going to a boy to a man that there is. 
my boy, something hit me right when he did that. I said, golly, he's 17 years old, and he just became a man. He understood authority. He accepted responsibility. He said, I was wrong. I've dealt with this so much in churches. I got 45 to 75 year old men that don't accept biblical spiritual authority. Not from God, not from me as a shepherd. Won't let me be your pastor. You let me be a preacher as long as it's pulpit, but you won't let me shepherd you. You won't let me be your pastor. You won't ask me for help. You won't ask me to teach the Word of God. I give you the opportunities, and you don't learn it. And you're just kind of stiff-arming God out of your life. You're in charge. Your pride is guiding you, and you're not accepting or understanding authority. When you understand authority, God will move you, I guarantee you, from being a boy to a man. It takes a man to stand up on God's Word, I promise you. It is not a sissy thing. It takes a man to stand on God's Word and to say no to a woman that's trying to get you to head the wrong direction or do the wrong thing, to say no to your friends that are trying to get you to do head the wrong, to say no, to say no to sin. It takes a man to stand up on God's Word. Boys can't do that. Boys can't say no to sin. It takes a man to understand authority and say no to sin. So if you, if you, uh, as you're doing this, it's a difficult thing to do, I promise you. So to be mature, to go from being a man, from a boy to a man, to that mature manhood, you're going to have to study the Word of God. I want you to look at Proverbs right there in the center of your Bible. You find Psalms and Proverbs chapter 1 and verse 7. I'll just show you a couple scriptures right here, and uh, I'm going to wrap her up. Proverbs chapter 1 and verse 7. Psalms, Proverbs, right? I just thumb through my Bible, dead center, open it up, and I almost find it every time. Proverbs 1, 7, it says, The fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge. It says, fools despise wisdom and instruction. We're talking about authority. When you understand authority, the Bible says also that uh, if a man can't take corrective counsel, he's a fool. So we win. This, this fear of the Lord is respect and knowledge of the Word of God. We win as men when we study the Word of God. Proverbs chapter Eight. Look forward just a few chapters. Proverbs eight thirteen. He says, "The fear of the Lord is hatred of evil. Pride and arrogance are the way of evil, and perverted speech I hate." So the fear of the Lord is hatred of evil. We 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 hate sin. That when we begin to fear the Lord, we we despise sin. We're not going to do it ourselves. We're going to become men. But pride and arrogance can just keep us being a boy. So, in other words, the fear of the Lord equals a man, and pride and arrogance is a boy. And so, uh, in God's eyes, I don't know about y'all, but this Father's Day, I, I, I want to change. I, I believe that I can get better. And, I, and look at this last slide. When boys become men is the goal. Not when men are boys, but our goal at Circle J Cowboy Church is to move from being boys, no matter what your age is, to men. And we do that when we begin to own our own purpose. I'm not goading you into that. Your wife is not goading you into that. God is leading you by the power of the Holy Spirit, and you take a hold of it and your gifts, and you earn it. And then you take responsibility for what he has you to do as a man, and then you will begin to understand authority, especially when you study the Word of God. I don't know about y'all, but I'm too old to be a boy anymore. <laughs> and you are too. And I'm not talking about the way people look at us in the world. I'm talking about the way God sees you. I want to be seen 
when he said, I'm looking for a man, but I found one. I don't want him in my vicinity saying that, those words. And I know for you too, I'm looking at some of you in the eye, godly men that are making a stand for God, making a difference in your families and your grandkids, and you're doing all these things, and I'm proud of you. There's not very many boys in here that I'm looking at. Let's pray. Father, we come to you. I ask you in the name of Jesus that we would today, in the areas of our life where we have slipped and drifted into just being a boy and not a man, that in your eyes I pray for forgiveness. Where we have not owned our purpose that you put us on the earth for, we've got We've got other purposes, but we've laid down your purpose. I pray for forgiveness. Lord, we leave this place today owning our purpose and taking responsibility for our families, our wives, and the spiritual condition of our families and our wives. And us, Lord, we leave this summer is going to be a great time of mature manhood where we find our own gifts and we use that to make a difference for you. Lord, I pray that that where we've been uh, not yielding to your authority, not yielding to the authority of your holy word, Lord, that you bring, that you just forgive us. We, we repent of that. We come to you in the name of Jesus, asking you to forgive us. And sir, you may be here, or ma'am, and you've missed the first step. You really don't know God. If you were to go to heaven or hell, you don't know whether you go to heaven or hell. If you were to die right now, you, you don't it's there, there's that question. It's a big old giant question mark in your heart. Do I really know God? Maybe today you need to pray to receive Jesus and say, Jesus, today I'm asking you to come into my life. And you ask him right where you sit. I'm asking you to come into my life right now in the name of Jesus. Forgive me of my sin. Forgive me of my sin and cleanse me of my unrighteousness. Everything. Make me new. I'm asking you to take the weight of all this sin off my life. And you died for me. I'm committed to live for you. In Jesus' name. Amen.